Now up to that point, I was an introvert, painfully shy. I was afraid of adults because adults had abused me my whole life. And so I would go into church and then I would leave immediately afterwards. I had a few friends at school, not a lot of friends. I was the introverted, shy guy. And I remember thinking like, this, this is what happened to Peter. Something completely changed him because he's, he was introverted and shy and he was afraid to even admit he was a disciple of Jesus. And so I did the most dangerous thing that I have ever done in my life. And it wasn't a sin, it was a prayer. I closed my Bible and I sat on the edge of my bed and I said, God, if this is real, I know at four years old, I said the sinner's prayer with my mom but I want to be like Peter. And I was like, if this is real and if the Holy Spirit can transform, I want, and all, I remember all I said was that last phrase, I want it. Well, Mike, it's a pleasure to have you uh, here with us. Um, for the people who don't know you, if you could just give us your full name and where you're from. Yeah, my name is Mike Signorelli and I'm originally from south of Chicago in Northwest Indiana. Come on. Now, Mike, you have a powerful testimony, and it's an honor to be able to hear it, to be able to record it. Uh, let's start with your life before Jesus. What did that look like? How, uh, and take us to just how you got to this point where you're at in your life. Yeah, my life before Jesus. My life actually started in a trailer park in South Chicago, Northwest Indiana, and it starts with brokenness. It starts with my biological father cheating on my mother. And before she discovered him cheating, there was domestic violence. It was very common for um, him to give her black eyes, grab her by the hair, and drag her through the house. And unfortunately, the last straw was the infidelity. And so now my mom is a single mother and she's living in a trailer park and she has a young Mike Signorelli. You know, it was funny because when my grandmother first brought me home, or my grandmother and my mother first brought me home from the hospital, my family on my mother's side's kind of country. And there was a country singer named Loretta Lynn and her, her husband's name was Doolittle. And so my grandmother jokingly said, oh, look, there's Loretta and Doolittle. And so from that moment on, uh, they dubbed me Doolittle and pretty much everybody who knew me from birth until 18 years old exclusively called me Doolittle. And so I come from very simple, very, very basic beginnings living in a tin roof trailer park in Northwest Indiana, just south of Chicago uh, with a single mom on welfare. And she was just working jobs to try to make it happen for us. So that's really life before Jesus. You know, there was this really powerful moment though, when I was four years Years old. Now, my mom had always played like a saloon style honky tonk piano and being kind of country from West Virginia, now living in Indiana. And she had some background as a teenager leading worship in her local church, but she had backslidden and left, left the Lord. And she married my dad, had me. And now all of a sudden I'm four years old. And my mother was reading the newspaper one day, and as she was reading the newspaper, it, there was an advertisement that said a local church pastor looking for a worship leader. And at this time, at four years old, my mother had already remarried, and so now I had a stepdad. Unfortunately, he was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and he was also physically abusive. So at, at this time, my mother had a broken rib, broken toe, um, also just another cycle of abuse, but she picked up the phone and she called this number and she told the pastor, she said, Hey, I, I'm a former worship leader for when I was a teenager. It's been years and years since I served the Lord. Um, and now I'm in a my ab second abusive marriage and I can lead worship for you, but, um, I don't, I'm not even a Christian anymore. And, um, makes me emotional every time I tell this part of the story because that pastor, he said, honey, uh, I'm coming over to your house right now. I'm going to bring my wife with me. And you, you know, you tell me um, if you're ready, because I'm ready to lead you back to Jesus. And my wow. mom with tears in her eyes, she said, I'm ready. And so I'll never forget. This is one of the deepest memories that marked my entire existence. At four years old, I watched this pastor and his wife come into my house. And all of a sudden, 
Um, they begin to pray with my mother. Now at four years old, I did not understand all that was going on. All I knew was that my mom was crying. And when it was over, I saw a joy on my mom that I had never seen before up to that point. And in the most simplistic way possible, when my mom tucked me in that night, uh, she said, do little, do you know what happened to me? You know, do you know? And I said, no, mom, but you're so happy. And I, I that's all I remember telling you. I just, you're so happy. And she said, do you want to be happy? Do you want to receive this too? And so I received uh, Jesus Christ um, into my life at four years old. My mom led me through the sinner's prayer. And that was my first moment uh, with, with Jesus. And I was eternally grateful for that pastor. As a matter of fact, he was true to his promise. Not only did he lead my mom back to Christ, but he also debuted her as his worship leader. And, uh, all these years later, it still just gets me so choked up because had he not been willing to make that house call, if he wouldn't have showed up, you know, um, I now I, I understand how rare it is that a pastor will show up to your house. Um, but he just heard a 20 something year old woman in her second abuse of marriage calling out for help. And he showed up with his wife and my, and that, that really changed everything for our family because we still had trauma, we still had pain, we still had poverty, but now we had Jesus. And my mom started, um, you know, basically leading worship all over and she took that saloon style, honky tonk, hillbilly style and she started learning worship. And and so for me, at now I'm five years old, six, seven, eight, nine, I started learning instruments the bass, the piano, the guitar, the drums, and accompanying my mom in worship. And that was basically, for me, that was part of my journey. But it wasn't until I was 15 years old that I really understood. You know, I think my mom received Christ and really repented in her 20s when that pastor came to our house. But I think for me, I said the sinner's prayer at four years old, but it wasn't until I was 15 years old that I had my own personal encounter. It's just one of those things where you can stand in a garage and never become a car and you can stand in church and never become a Christian. And so I was playing instruments with my mother. I was listening to all the sermons. I was inspired by, by them, but nothing had really happened in my heart. It was really a true conversion. As a matter of fact, I um, was very curious about the Bible. I was super introverted. I privately read the Bible. I was obsessed with reading the Bible, eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 11. My mom bought me picture Bibles and then a teen Bible and then a King James version. And so I was graduating all of these versions of the Bible, but I, it was like in my head, but it wasn't actually in my spirit. It wasn't in my heart yet. And so it hadn't traveled down and it wasn't until I was 15, fast forward, my mom had gotten a couple more divorces and marriages. And even as a Christian woman was just struggling with um, basically having a healthy home. And uh, now all of a sudden I'm the oldest of five kids and my mom had twins for the last two. And so there's Sandra with her five kids. And because of the multiple abusive stepdads and the brokenness and the poverty, it was like by the time I had got to 15 years old, I, I was just like kind of, I was, just mad. I was super upset. I felt like betrayed. I'm like, why does this keep happening to me? And I was super desperate. But then I had read the Bible. My goal was to read it from Genesis to Revelation every year. And I had read it in multiple translations since I was a kid. I had just obsessed over scripture. But now at 15 years old, it was like, I'm reaching this point as a teenager where I don't want to live like the world. I wasn't sleeping around. I wasn't doing drugs. I wasn't drinking, but I also didn't have a real intimate relationship with God. I didn't really know him. I had just been going to church with my mom, having these religious experiences. Then all of a sudden, as I was reading the Bible at 15, I got to the book of Acts. And now that I'm becoming like a young adult, I started understanding things in a way I didn't understand it before. And um, I remember um, reading Acts chapter two, 
And this man named Peter gets up and filled with the Holy Spirit, he preaches this powerful sermon and a couple thousand people get saved. And I remember literally stopping and going, no way, not Peter. I didn't even remember. I'm like, Peter, that guy that was afraid of the little girl, Peter. And I'm, I remember like, I was like the same guy that Jesus was correcting all the time. Like to me, Peter was like a loser. And I'm like, but Peter, and I, I remember it started clicking. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what transformation looks like. Now, up to that point, I was an introvert, painfully shy. I was afraid of adults because adults had abused me my whole life. And so I would go into church and then I would leave immediately afterwards. I had a few friends at school, not a lot of friends. I was the introverted, shy guy. And I remember thinking like, this, this is what happened to Peter. Something completely changed him because he's, he was introverted and shy and he was afraid to even admit he was a disciple of Jesus. And so I did the most dangerous thing that I have ever done in my life. And it, and it wasn't a sin. It was a prayer. I closed my Bible and I sat on the edge of my bed and I said, God, if this is real, I know at four years old, I said the sinner's prayer with my mom but I want to be like Peter. And I was like, if this is real and if the Holy Spirit can transform, I want, and all, I remember all I said was that last phrase, I want it. And as soon as I said, I want it, I, I mean, I know this didn't happen in reality, but I felt like wind just blew through my room. In my mind, the curtains came off the curtain rod. It felt like that. And I just started to speak in other, in another language. I started to speak in tongues uncontrollably, loudly. And I started experiencing this crazy, crazy transformation. And that's when I truly believe that I received salvation in that moment because I knew and understood what I was asking for. I think at five years old, I was just asking for happiness. But at 15 years old, I was asking for Jesus. And when I did that, I, I was completely and totally transformed. But the thing is, nobody knew it because I kind of had kept that experience private after it was over. And then, and and really quick, Mike, why why did you make that decision to not tell? Why why keep it to yourself? I decided to keep it to myself because it was so dramatic, and I had built my entire life around this persona of introverted Mike, Mike that slips in and slips out, Mike that just does his work in school and goes home. I had built this whole world around an identity, and now the Holy Spirit had just destroyed that whole identity, mm -hmm. and He had empowered me and changed me, but I'm like, how do I let people know that I have this superpower? It, it felt like, you know, God had given me something. Thing, and I'm like, I'm too afraid to even tell people mm. what had happened. Yeah. And what happened from there? How did, how did that begin to, to change your life? Because that's huge. If God starts something in you, he will always be faithful to finish it. And here's the thing. I cried out for God and God came and baptized me in the Holy Spirit. And he was going to fulfill what he started in me, even though I tried to hide it. And the story of my life is so sovereign. And that's why it's such an emotional experience to even try to talk about it. Because out of poverty, out of abuse, out of trauma, multiple stepdads, out of all this pain, there was this story that God was weaving. And it was wasn't soon after that experience, I call it my personal Pentecost, that all of a sudden, one Sunday, I walked out of my little Spanish church. We went to a Spanish church. It was a bilingual church. And um, I walked out of church and I, I, I would leave before everybody else. So as soon as the service was getting ready to end, that's when my cue was to leave. So I didn't have to have conversations with anyone. And all of a sudden, I walk out of church and it's in this neighborhood in South Chicago and this woman comes walking down the street and all of a sudden this woman sees me and she's squinting her eyes and then all of a sudden her eyes get really big and she points her finger towards me and she said, I saw you in a dream. I know where I saw you. I saw you in a dream. Now I start freaking out because I'm like, I already don't like people. I'm introverted and now I have this woman who I've never seen in my life confronting me and she said, I saw you in a dream. I'm like, woman, no you didn't. Now where I'm from in the hood, I think to myself, there's crazy 
crazy psychopaths walking around. I think this woman's just crazy. And I'm like, lady, no, you didn't. You're crazy. Woman, you're crazy. And then she says the next thing. She says, I saw you in my dream and you preached at my church and revival broke out. And then I get even more scared because all I had this personal experience with the Holy Spirit. Now this woman's calling me out on this corner, this street corner. I've never seen this woman in my life. And I'll never forget. I told her, I said, woman, no, you didn't. I'm 15 years old. I've never preached in my life. No, you didn't have that dream. And she looked at me. She said, no, it was you. I know it was you in my dream. So I brushed her off. I tried to walk away from her. But here's the thing about the persistence of this woman. That woman went back to my church every single Sunday for weeks trying to find me because she was so convinced of this prophetic dream. Wow. Now I kept trying to push her off. It all culminated to her going to my pastor. And my pastor said, let's just bring Mike and this woman in my office and let's deal with this for once and for all. And so he looked at me and he looked at her and he said, Mike, this woman's had a dream. This woman believes in this dream. And uh, just tell her you won't do it. Because everybody in the church knew me as the shy guy, the introverted guy. And when he said that phrase, just tell this woman you won't do it, something activated in my spirit. It, it was like, if he would have said, tell her you're going to do it, I probably would have said no. But when he said, just tell this woman you won't do it, just tell her you can't do this. And when he said it, something activated, and I believe it was the that same um personal Pentecost I had. It was like my spirit was moving faster than my flesh because my flesh wanted to say no, but all of a sudden out of my mouth leapt, yes, I'll do it. Wow. And the whole room got quiet. And the woman who had been asking for weeks, she got quiet. Then my pastor who thought this is the shy guy and I'm trying to help him by canceling this thing. She all of a sudden, or he got real quiet. And then I got quiet realizing, oh no, I just I just confirmed it. Like I just stepped into this. And so it was a couple months after that because she went back to her pastor. She got like a Sunday night event scheduled. And then here comes a 15 year old Mike Signorelli. I had to borrow a suit because I didn't own any suits. And back in the day, you always had to preach in a suit. And I had my Bible and it was so crazy. I had never been to seminary. I had never been trained in any way. I had just spent all these years reading the Bible, but only knowing it in my head. But once the Holy Spirit baptized me, it was like, now I step into this assignment. I'm deathly afraid. I'm looking at all their faces. They call my name to come up. I'm shaking, just trembling, holding this microphone. The first 30 seconds of my sermon is the worst sermon you've ever heard in your life. I, I'm stuttering. I can hardly get the words out. But then the only way I can tell you what happened was it was like I got struck by lightning. And the next 30 minutes, I blacked out. All I know is I start preaching. I mean, people are shouting. Young people are jumping up. Then I open up the altar. The, everybody floods the altar. And this woman's prophetic dream about revival, it literally happens to the point where I don't know how. I don't know what I say. It just it just activated this gift of preaching. And so from 15 years old until I went to college, I started becoming known now. And it was like a new nickname, uh, Mighty Mike, because I'm preaching all these youth things all over. And I have this whole other identity of, and they start calling me Mighty Mike. And I'm praying for people and they're getting healed of all kinds of crazy diseases. I'm praying for people and they're getting delivered. Demons are kept coming out of them. And this whole other life started for me and it was like my own family were the ones that were like I can't believe it's Mike hmm. I can't believe it's him he hated when we prayed he hated when you know the things of God would happen now he's the main one doing it and that really for me was like a major major transformation wow now right there before you continue even to what God did after um, a lot of the times when we hear people share their testimony from youth and, and God using them, there's usually, you know, things that come into play that'll try to take them away from that life. Did you ever, as you were going through your teenage years, did you ever had any problems with what you were seeing around you when it came to women? Like, was there any influence there? Was God fully protecting you? Uh, I just would love to get some insight as uh, what you were experiencing in that time. 
I can truly say that through my teen years, something was so holy and sovereign over my life that I was not struggling with temptation. I I could go to parties with my friends and we refused drugs and alcohol every time. Wow. I had little dating relationships, but I kept it pure the entire time. That personally was not my struggle in my teen years. And I was staying so busy doing the work of ministry and traveling all over the Midwest that I was just completely obsessed and consumed with the things of God. But what actually happened, and this was my big vice, as I've always been incredibly intellectual. I, I remember even being in poverty, we owned a set of Encyclopedia Britannicas, and I read the entire set. So I was obsessed with learning just as much as I was the things of God. And so it wasn't until, I, so I ended up um, going through some really difficult times in my teen years because uh, once the last stepdad left, then it, it left my mother as a single mom and financially we we're struggling. And I had made a decision uh, actually to leave high school. I ended up getting my GED and then I took my SATs and I had an Ivy League level score on my SATs at 16, which got me a full ride scholarship to a local college. So I actually started college at 17 years old wow. while all my friends were still in high school. But then I did that partly so that I could work a job and financially help support my mother and my four siblings. So I really was feeling the weight and the burden of stepping in to basically be a dad before I should have been a dad, be an adult before I should have been an adult. And even though my intelligence was able to get me a full full ride scholarship and I started college in the evening and I was able to look at my peers and say, hey, you guys are still in high school, but I went from a GED to my SATs to college before you're even done. I also was working at the Hammond Water Department and a blue collar job like a little man and giving my check to my family every single week in that time. But then what happened in college was eventually my mom got married the last and final time. And this was to a righteous man of God and it really alleviated the burden from me. And he stepped in and started to lead. And I was like, oh, I was right at the point where I felt like I was going to break. So at 18 years old, I quit my job for the water department. And then I went to college full time to finish my degree, but I moved to Indiana University, Bloomington. And now in a big 10 university, I'm taking a biology class and the professor literally gets up just like a cliche of what you see in the God's Not Dead movies. This is the early 2000s. He gets up and he was like, hey, if you believe in God, you're, you're an idiot. Mm. And he was like, God doesn't exist. We're gonna take this biology class, but I'm gonna begin to show you how foolish it is to believe in the existence of God. Wow. And I had never heard anybody talk like that before. And that's when the seed was sown of skepticism and atheism and doubt in my mind. Well, well, take us through that, right? What, because now you, you've, you've had all of these years of walking with God, experiencing, even being filled with the Holy Spirit and now atheism. How did your life progress from there? I had seen medically verifiable miracles already. I had seen the lost accept Christ. I had preached sermons all over the Midwest before I was 18 years old. But now I'm sitting in this lecture hall with over 200 students in Bloomington, Indiana. And this guy is saying that God doesn't exist. And then I remember the exact thought. The thought was, oh, wow. I come from just poor people, the, the poverty of, of uh, the, the culture of poverty. And no, nobody I knew was college educated on both sides of my family. Mm. And I remember thinking like, oh, what if this whole thing's been a lie? Wow. What, what if intelligent people don't believe in God, but then like basically unintelligent people or poor people where I come from, just average everyday people, they do believe in God. And it just started working over in my mind. It kept growing like a cancer, one thought at a time, one cell at a time. And then I remember thinking like, oh no, what if all those miracles were the power of placebo? What if it was the power of positive thinking? What if it was all just people unlocking human potential? Like they believe that they were healed and then their body released things to heal them. And wow. I, it just kept growing and growing. And my mind just started completely infiltrating all of the, the gospel and all those seeds that were sown. And it just felt like with your body, it's like when cancer's in your body, your whole body's not sick. It's just, but the problem is the cancer grows. And so it was like my, I felt like before,
before that moment in that lecture hall, I was 100% devoted to God. But then all of a sudden those seeds, those doubts, those fears, maybe I was living a lie, it just kept growing. And then it was like the percentage of Mike Signorelli that was full of doubt kept growing and growing and growing. And ultimately that led to full, blow, full blown atheism. Wow. And I, and it was like, it was crazy how it happened. It didn't happen instantly. It happened over the t course of about a year and a half of me, like going from class to class, having conversations with people and then realizing like mainly people don't believe in God. They're all middle class or upper middle class. They're, it's like, you know, for, and then I'm doing this compare contrast between my life and their life. And I'm like, well, maybe I just come from a whole bunch of, I, I mean, for, forgive the phrase, but like, maybe I just come from a whole bunch of dumb hillbillies. Maybe I just come from a whole bunch of hood rats. Like maybe we all just need God like a crutch. Mm. And it's just this thing that this, this thing we have that makes us feel better. And maybe it's, it was, maybe it was emotionalism when I had that moment with the Holy Spirit. And I start going through that and then a year and a half of that kind of thinking. And now here I am in one of the top 10 party schools in the nation getting trashed, it's like literally having inappropriate relationships with women. And I am a full blown sinner. I'm, I'm backslidden. I'm, I'm full blown in it. And it was crazy because people saw me make that transformation and they didn't even want to believe it was possible. Like, no, mighty Mike, that guy who came and prayed for us, that guy who led us to Christ, like what he's drinking, he's partying now he's sleeping around like what that guy. And, and it was because I had let that atheistic, this secular, you know, this humanistic thing come into me. And, and it, but what I didn't do is I didn't study. I didn't fact check it. I didn't do that journey initially. I just let it thrive inside of me and try to solve that problem on my own. And I, I couldn't. Wow. What was the, when, when it came to your leaders specifically and the people that uh, were close to you in, in ministry, what, what was their response did they try to talk to you about it like did anybody come around you and try to actually meet with you and and kind of figure this thing out with you you know it's funny that you mentioned that the leaders that were in my life were all having their own personal struggles as well and what i've come to realize looking back at my story is when you have secret sin in your life you will um openly confirm someone else's and i think what i was looking for from the leaders in my life was somebody to stand for righteousness for somebody to grab me and shake me and be like mike this isn't the way this isn't who you are but unfortunately that never happened they had their own stuff that they were struggling with and so it's like they had doubt and i had a, had doubt and so it was like there was no doctor just two cancer patients Wow. And so it was like, sometimes um, when I look back at my story, I wish there was somebody who like grabbed me by the shirt and just said, I'm not going to let you live like this. I'm not, I'm going to talk to you. And that wasn't there. But God, again, and this is the story of God's mercy and grace in my life. He's always woven people into my story to actually come across my path and to bring that message. So when I was fifth, when I was five years old, he brought the pastor uh, from that job listing in the newspaper. When I was 15 years old, he brought that woman from the neighborhood who had a prophetic dream. And then now when I was 21 years old, I actually moved into this house on, it's right on campus. And I was going to have three random roommates and we we're all going to rent a bedroom of this house. And I'm meeting my roommates and there's this older gentleman at the time I looked, I thought he was old. He was 30 years old and he had come to Indiana university to do his, um, his graduate studies. And so I'm like, Hey, tell me a little bit about yourself. And he's like, my name is Lamont black. And I went to school for the theology and I'm now here in Indiana university to study economics. And I'm like, interesting. So he's like, tell me your story. So we start to get to know each other. And when he finds out that I used to be this hardcore Christian, that I used to be this preacher, and he's also a, a man of God now, and, and he's a theologian, he's like, so wait a second, you don't believe now, why? And over the course of that year, which is the junior year of my college, he just broke me down systematically. I mean, anything that I had, and he showed me that when you become a Christian, you don't stop, 
you don't stop being intellectual. Actually, to become a Christian is to ignite true intellect. Mm. And so he was telling me, like, listen, Christianity is not just for ignorant people. Christianity is for everybody. And you can defend through reason the, the, the tenets of our faith. You can, and actually science proves it doesn't disprove. And so he began to break me down over the course of that year. And I remember there's this uh, astrophysicist, Dr. Hugh Ross, and he was starting to show how astrophysics proved the existence of God. Then the movie came out by Mel Gibson, the, the, the crucifixion of Christ. And that, and I'm in the movie theater watching that and I'm, I'm getting the Holy Spirit's moving on me. And it was like, all these things converge. Then I live with a theologian who's breaking me down. And it was the first time that I saw that, wait a second, my spirit and my emotions and my mind can all become one for the kingdom. And I'll never forget, I rededicated my life to Christ in my, in that house with, with Lamont. And I remember crying and I was thinking about my mom who I thought was just a poor hillbilly. And, and I kept saying through the tears, my mom was right. My mom was right. My she didn't know science. She didn't know philosophy. She didn't know reason, but she knew the gospel and it was right. And so for me, I really rededicated my life in that moment uh, in college. And that was like a major next step for me in my journey. Whoa. Now, a lot of people, you know, know about you because obviously how God is using you today, even through uh, this incredible tool that we have with the internet, right, and YouTube and live streaming. Um, if you could just give us a little bit of insight from that moment that you had in college of rededicating your life to Jesus to uh, what God has now, you know, using you and how, how he's using you today. What happened in, in, in these last couple of years? How did he begin to now begin to uh, use you again after that season? You know, I really believe that the truest part of me it, on the inside is this 15-year-old before seminary training, before Indiana University and secular college, before getting married, there was this 15 year old um, person that just said, Jesus, I know that you're real. I want your Holy Spirit. And I say, yes. And you know, the foolish things of the world will confound the wise. And I had to learn how to become a fool for Christ again and stay a fool for Christ and say, God, use me. I, here I am, reckless abandoned. So for, for these last several years, that's what I've been doing. I've been saying, God, I don't want to become a professional Christian. You know, there's a lot of professional Christians. You know, they work for church staffs. They uh, clock in, clock out. They, they go to seminary school and they learn all of the new vocabulary word and they get online with, and they're hypercritical of everything that's happening. And it's like, I don't want to be a critic. You know, I'd rather be an author than a literary critic. I'd rather be a chef than a food critic. And I'd rather be a Christian than one criticizing Christianity. I'd rather be a true follower. And so that's it. I've been trying to do the commands of Christ the great commission. And so here's the thing, like I'm still have a little bit of that introverted in me. And during the pandemic, it was actually my wife who was like, Mike, I know that you can't physically preach at your church locations here in New York city, but just grab your phone and just do what you've always do done. Just start preaching. And so all of a sudden I grabbed my phone during the pandemic and what started with 80 people watching me. I remember watching it. Literally the number went up 600, 700, 800, a thousand, 2000, 2.2 thousand people were getting free all over the place. And it was just the foolishness of God. It was just grab your phone and be obedient. And so all these years later, yeah, I've, I've got married. Um, I, Actually, I'm fortunate enough to have two daughters of my own, Bella and Everly. My wife, Julie, is there alongside of me. But I was just faithful to just keep saying yes, no matter what he said. That ended up meaning that I was going to move from Indiana where I had bought a home with a half acre backyard and, you know, a four seasons room that looked off the back. And I had to sell that house. I gave away one third of all my possessions, fit everything in a U-Haul. And then I ended up um, moving to New York City. And then after moving to New York City, with only 18 people in our church, we made disciples that made disciples that made disciples. 18 turned into to thousands. And now we're a national church with locations everywhere. We had fastest growing church in America for the last four years in a row. But it all started way back when how God's been threading that narrative through my life of just complete and total surrender and just saying yes over and over and over again, no matter how crazy it looks, no matter how wild it looks, no matter how impossible 
impossible it looks, knowing that he is going to make all things possible. Mike, when you, when you had that, that season, um, in your life where you kind of stepped away and, and f fell into atheism and now then you rededicate your life to God, did it, did it feel like you were starting over? Did, did you have a struggle kind of coming back into a relationship with God or was it like, okay, no, we 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 left right where we just, you know, we, we took off right where we left. Like, what was that like for you? I had struggled to really fully come back. It was like I wanted to do it in my emotions, but now I had opened up a door in the flesh that I had never opened before. I managed to live in the hood, surrounded by drugs and alcohol and all that for my entire teens, never gave in to sexual temptation, never gave in to drugs or alcohol. But then now in my 20s, when I finally did, and I had fulfilled the desires of the flesh, it was so difficult now because I had to deal deal with it on the level of my appetite. I had to deal with it on the level of those experience. And I really had to learn what sanctification was all about, taking one step at a time and basically saying no. It's a lot easier to say no to something you've never done than to say no to something that you've done many times because the flesh loves it. The flesh desires it. And so I really had to learn in that season of rededicating my life back to Christ, how to crucify the flesh daily, die to self daily. I had to block people. I had to tell people, hey, I can't be friends with you because you're not a friend of my future. You're a friend of my past and my past is dead. And so that was a journey I had to go on with Jesus. And it's one thing to watch Jesus hang on the cross, but that's the first cross, not the final cross. We've got to hang on the cross as well. Mm -hmm. And I had to make a decision. I was going to learn how to die to self. And it was a, it was a journey. It was a road. I'm still on that journey right now. Every day I'm, I'm walking that thing out. But in that season of rededicating and redevoting my life to Christ, I had to learn that that very narrow path. Mm. Mike, for the people who are watching your testimony right now, who uh, are in that season where you were just faithfully walking with the Lord 15, you know, uh, as a teenage year, as a young boy, and uh, those those who are watching you right now who are in that season on fire for God, uh, maybe are feeling a little bit pressure from the world and everything that's going on around them. What is just a word of encouragement that you can give to that young person who is watching you uh, share your testimony right now? The word of encouragement that I would give to a young person right now is when you're on Snapchat, you're on for hours. When you're on TikTok, you're on for hours. When you're on Instagram, you're on for hours. And what's happening is you're feeding relationships and it's starting to pull you in a certain direction. What I did as a teenager, and I'm so thankful for this, as I spent hours in prayer. And see, prayer is not just you talking to God, it's you allowing Him to talk to you through the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you, the first five minutes might be awkward, then 10 minutes is awkward, 30, but there is this invisible line that you cross and you'll know because the tangible presence of God will roll into the room and you'll be too afraid to even open up your eyes sometimes. You'll be like, if I open my eyes, I'm gonna see Him. It'll be that real. And I have a 16 year old now, I was just telling her this the other day. I said, when I say pray, I don't mean like a religious person that just begs God, God, give me this, change this. I'm talking about, I want to know you. I want to build a relationship with you. And I know that all of you can do that because you do it on Snapchat. You do it on TikTok. Just put your phone away and say, okay, God, let's snap. Like, okay, God, like I'm here. I'm ready to scroll. Like, take me on this journey. And man, in my teenage years, I remember spending hours with God, like getting completely lost. I would put my music on and back in the day, this was because I'm old school, this was CDs. And I would have that CD spinning, the music would be on, I would lock my door and I was just gone. And I do believe that it's like, however you spend your time, that's what you're feeding. You're either feeding your faith or you're feeding your fears, you're feeding your doubts. And so it's just spending that time. There's no other way around it. Yeah. And so for me, when somebody would be like, hey, do you want to try some alcohol? I'm like, dude, there's nothing you can offer me that will compare to what I just felt in the presence of God in my room. There's there's nothing better than that. It's all going to be an invitation. It wasn't until later on in life I accepted the, the bait of Satan and got all tripped up with that. But in my teen years, I was just all in. And it really is true. Whatever the world offers you, God has something better. Come on. Now, for that person who is uh, watching, who is now struggling with that uh, season of doubt, 
right? And, and not really knowing if this is something that they want to do for the rest of their life, if they don't really believe in God, you know, and faith is, is dying down in, inside of them. Yeah. What can you say to that person who is watching your testimony right now? I want you to go back to the moment where you were saved. I want you to remember the very first time you felt that love. Probably you were crying. Probably when you got done praying, somebody prayed with you. Maybe, maybe you were all alone, but, I, but you remember that feeling of weightlessness. You remember how clean you felt. And that's the moment you have to go back to over and over and over again. The Bible talks about returning to your first love. And so you've got to go back. It's why you saw me almost cry multiple times telling my story, because when I go back to that prayer at five years old, when I go back to that prayer at 15 years old, when I go back to that prayer at 21 years old, I still remember, okay, my first love was returning to me and I was returning to him. The Bible says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. And so you take a step closer to him in those moments where you say, God, I remember when you first encountered me. I remember when you changed me, when you washed me with your blood. I remember how, how pure and holy and acceptable I felt and realized I was. And you got to renew that in your heart every single time you go back. That's why David said, I remember. There's something about remembering. I remember when he delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear. Surely he'll deliver me from this. Sometimes you got to go back and remember and say, God, I remember when you delivered me from this before, another version of it. Deliver me of this version right now. Hmm. Mike, who is Jesus to you? Yeah. Jesus truly is my best friend. Jesus is my Lord, which means I submit to him. I don't do my will. I do his will. Jesus is, is everything. I mean, through every season of my life, Jesus, I've gotten another revelation of Jesus. That's why I get so excited about heaven. It'll never get old because it, for infinity, we'll get a new revelation of who he is. It's like, we're going to get our mind blown every single second of heaven. And so here on earth, it's like who Jesus was at five years old, who Jesus was at 15, 21, 39, 49. It's like, and, and so for me, it's like the best relationship in my life because I'm always coming to know him in a new way. He's somebody, he's another aspect of himself for me in every season I've needed him. And um, I think that's why I live such a life of reckless abandon because he gave all. So I feel like the least I can do is give all. I, I know all I'm giving him is ashes and brokenness, but I'm gonna give it all because he gave all. And so like for me, I pray continuously. I have conversations with Jesus all day. When I lay down and sleep, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I'm literally saying, God, meet me in my dreams tonight. I want to, it's like, I, I don't want to be away from him. And I think like on that other side of, of uh, reconciling my, my relationship with Jesus, it's just been a, a, um, just crazy hunger and a desire and a thirst for him. And I, for me, like hell is not flames. You know, I know that depiction, like to me, like the worst pain of hell is separation from him. Like to me, that's it. And so I think about that scripture where it says, people are casting out demons in my name. People are, are doing all these things, but he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And so it's like, yes, people see me doing deliverance and prophesying and preaching big conferences and all that, but I don't want to be the guy where I show up and he's like, Mike, you did all these incredible things in my name, but I never knew you. And so my number one, it's like what everything flows from that relationship. I'm married. I have a wife and kids, but even more so than my relationship with my spouse, with my kids, it's got to be him first and foremost. Mike, any last words for the people who are watching your testimony right now? My biggest encouragement is that wherever there's pain, there's purpose. Wherever there's brokenness, there is breakthrough. And my story is a story of multiple abusive stepdads. And now somehow the entire internet dubbed me Papa Sigs. And I'm a spiritual father to many people now. And I laugh because I don't have a biological father. My father died prematurely. I laugh because all of my spiritual fathers were pastors that unfortunately are not even in ministry anymore because they had infidelity or money impropriety. And I'm still here. And so my greatest area of 
brokenness through all my story when I was 5, 15, 21 now has been, God, I wish I had a dad and, and a physical father never came. But the Holy Spirit, my heavenly father did come to me. And then guess what? He's made me so much like him that when I'm on the internet or wherever I'm at in my church locations, they're like, look, there's Papa Siggs. And the funniest thing is, and nobody knew this, and it was such a holy moment. Um, the few years that I did have my biological father before he died, I called him Papa. And nobody knew that. And I'll never forget at the height of the pandemic, looking in the comment section, one person put in there like, I'm gonna call you Papa Sigs. And then the whole chat was like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's it, that's it. And it just exploded. And I, I just wanna encourage people like, wherever you're broken, wherever there's pain, that's where your purpose is. And my definition of purpose now is do what the devil doesn't think you'll do. Like the devil, the devil doesn't think that I'll preach into a camera. So that's why I'm going to do it because he doesn't think I'll do it. He doesn't think that I'll be a father to my children and a father to God's children as a spiritual father. He thinks I'll quit. I'll give up. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what he thinks I won't do. And I want to encourage you, if there's any part of my story that you heard, just leave this with something in you that says, I'm going to do what the devil doesn't think I'll do. That's your purpose.